Move to questions without notice. Are there any questions? And I give the call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Core inflation in Australia is higher than every major advanced economy. It is higher than the US, the UK, Canada, the Euro area, Japan, Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, and New Zealand, Prime Minister. With falling disposable income and sticky high inflation hurting households, why is the Albanese Labor government fighting the Reserve Bank? While Australian families go backwards. Give the call to the Prime Minister. The member for Page is warned no one is to interject before an answer begins. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'm asked about international comparisons, and I can't do better than uh, quote Michelle Bullock, the RBA Governor, who said this on the 6th of August 2024. We didn't go as high as the Fed. Our interest rates are lower, I would observe, than the Bank of England, the U US Fed, Bank of New Zealand all have interest rates up above five. Bank of Canada did too. We don't. Peak headline uh, hit on an annual basis at 7.8 per cent in Australia. That was before we came into government. It is now half. We have halved inflation from where it was in 2000. And 22. In the UK, 11.1 per cent. In New Zealand, 7.3. In Canada, 8.1. In the US, 9.9. Uh, the uh, current cash rate uh, here in Australia, of course, is 4.35. In the UK, it's 5. In New Zealand, it's 5.25. And in the United States, it is 5.5. Uh, the cash rate under the Leader of the Opposition as Assistant Treasurer was 6.75. Order. Yep. Was 6.75. Order. Order. The member for Deakin will cease the dejecting. Member for Morton. The, Order. The member for, the member for, the member for Deakin thinks it was funny that his leader was once Assistant Treasurer. <laughs> Well, the, the no, joke the, was on the Australian people, because the bizarre joke is that those people come in here, come in here when inflation was double what it was, what it is today, the when we came Barker into office, when rejecting. employment has seen some 980,000 jobs, when we see, when we see wages, wages increasing rather than decreasing, which is what those opposite wanted to see, when we see the workforce Order. participation rate at record levels, when we see the gender pay gap at a record low of 11.5 per cent, and when we, see, when we see the economy, of course, under us, uh, experiencing modest growth. Modest growth, but growth nonetheless. Those opposite? Those opposite, if they had their way and implemented Order. the more than $300 billion of cuts, we would have seen a devastation in our economy had we followed what they want to do. Give the call to the member for Werriwa. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. How will the Albanese Labor government's proposal to limit young people's access to social media help and support Australian families? Yeah. Call to the Minister for Communications. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. Mr Speaker, parents shouldn't have to go it alone when navigating the complex world of social media for their children. And that is why the Albanese government will introduce legislation this year to limit the age of access for social media. Now, our approach, Mr Speaker, is not about telling parents how to raise their children. Their perspectives on this have been and will continue to be central to our approach. But parents have told me, and I'm sure they've told a lot of us, that they are overwhelmed trying to manage their children's social media access, and they want cultural and legal change. Mr Speaker, the Albanese government will drive that change. 
Parents know that social media has many benefits, including Member a way to Fisher. connect and communicate with friends and family, and even as an important tool for neurodivergent children. However, it can be addictive, it can be an avenue for cyberbullying and algorithms that surface harmful or adult content that children shouldn't see. That is why we are considering the perspectives of young people in our decision to limit access to social media. Young people expect governments and the platforms to protect them from the harms that they experience. The Butterfly Foundation notes that over the past 12 years, there has been a staggering 200 per cent increase in 10 to 14-year-olds with diagnosed eating disorders in Australia. And this has occurred at the same time that we have seen the growth and prevalence of social media use by young people and the influences they are exposed to on these platforms. And we know that social media has become a megaphone for the Andrew Tates of the world, who are cultivating narratives of misogyny and gender-based violence. Limiting young people's access to social media is an important step in a comprehensive approach to online safety that is central to the Albanese government's agenda. Mr Speaker, rarely is any government decision met with universal agreement, but so many parents are telling us that they need help and our government will support them. We cannot eliminate every harm facing young people online, but we can take steps to make their world safer than they are now. And our government will do all we can to address the harms that social media companies are unable or unwilling to address themselves. Yeah. We call to the Shadow Treasurer. My question is to the Treasurer. Last week, the Treasurer accused the RBA of smashing the economy. BlackRock's head of Australia Fixed Income, Craig Vardy, has said it was because the Treasurer, quote, needs a diversion from the key part the government is playing by not reining in spending to help bring inflation down. With falling disposable income and sticky high inflation hurting households, why is this government fighting the Reserve Bank while Australian families go backwards? Give the call. The Minister for Industry is warned. Rules apply to both sides of the chamber. Treasurer has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. If the Shadow Treasurer doesn't think that the combination of global economic uncertainty, persistent inflation and higher interest rates is slowing the economy, it's no wonder that nobody takes Order him seriously, Mr Speaker. Those are facts borne out in the national accounts. They're self-evident by any objective observer of our economy knows. Uh, that higher interest rates are slowing our economy. I don't think that's an especially controversial point. It's a point I've been making since at least June of this year, uh, Mr Speaker. Now, I'm asked whether I take responsibility for our part in the fight against inflation, and I do. And as the Prime Minister said a moment ago, in the year of our election, inflation was 7.8 per cent, and now it's got a three in front of it. Inflation has halved on our watch. And in that regard, Mr Speaker, I do take responsibility for the fact that we've turned two huge Liberal deficits into two big Labor surpluses. Yeah. And I do take responsibility for the way we've designed our cost of living help to take the edge off some of these price pressures in our economy. I take responsibility for banking almost all of the upward revision to revenue. I take responsibility working with my great colleague in the other place, Minister Gallagher, to find almost $80 billion in savings. Mr Speaker, I take responsibility for the fact that Governor Bullock has said that our two surpluses are helping in the fight against inflation. I've made it very clear that we have a role to play in the Order. fight against inflation, and that's one of the reasons why we are making welcome and encouraging progress. And because we're getting inflation down and because we're getting wages up, real wages are growing again in our economy after they were falling substantially when we came to office, Mr Speaker. And so I would really welcome the Shadow Treasurer asking us again and again and again about our cost of living help, about what we're doing to get wages moving again, about how we've turned his deficits into our surpluses, Mr Speaker. Now, the worst thing that we could be doing in these circumstances, where people are doing it tough and growth in our economy is soft and subdued, the worst thing we would do is pull out $315 billion in spending, Mr Speaker, which is what those opposite are proposing to do. They're proposing to cut $315 billion in spending. 
That includes the pay rise for aged care workers. It includes the indexation of the age pension, new medicines on the Order PBS, on cheaper right. childcare, veterans' compensation, natural disaster relief, strengthening Medicare, urgent care clinics, housing, defence spending, energy bill relief, rent assistance, women's safety, the parenting Gippsland. payment, the border force, cheaper medicine, biosecurity, paid parental leave, fee-free TAFE, the PAC payment and connectivity in regional and rural Australia, Mr Speaker. That's what's in their $315 billion in secret cuts. Is it any wonder they won't come clean about them? Order, there's far too much noise in the chamber. We're not having a repeat of yesterday. I'm asking all members to show restraint today, to improve the tone of the chamber, to cease interjections. The member for Groom was interjecting continuously through that answer. He'll leave the chamber under 94A. There are consequences for actions in this place. It's far too much noise all week. Today, things will be quiet. Member for Holt has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Youth. What have young people told us about the impacts of social media? What is the Albanese Labor government doing to limit the negative impacts and keep children and young people safe online? The call to the Minister for Early Childhood and the Minister for Youth. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the wonderful member for Holt for her question. The member's question goes to the voices of young people with regard to how social media impacts them. And incorporating the views and experiences of young people is an important part of what the Albanese government does. And it's why we established the Office for Youth in 2022 and why we have a youth engagement program. Through that program, we've heard from a range of young people about the effects of social media. And so, Mr Speaker, it's important that I convey some of those responses here in this House. Uh, one young person said of their social media experience. I know personally in my life coming across things that I probably couldn't even fathom. I think that parents really aren't aware of the extent of the things that their kids come across. Another added, I have friends who have been cyberbullied. Everyone knows someone who's had bad experiences with social media, whether it's cyberbullying or body image issues. Yet another one said, there are negative impacts of social media, such as mental health, body image, lack of attention span, which impacts study, schooling, education. And Mr Speaker, these quotes from young people demonstrate that children and young people are alive. They're alive to the negative impacts of social media on their mental health and on their social and physical well-being. Everyone has a responsibility to keep children and young people safe. Children on social media are in terrifying proximity to some of the worst and most damaging things online. It's linked to poor mental health, to low self-esteem, disordered eating, cyberbullying, anxiety and depression, just to name a few. Parents are concerned, teachers are concerned, youth workers, social workers, doctors, psychologists and young people themselves. Young people themselves are concerned. That's why this government is taking steps to protect children and young people online, both through our uh, education, which scaffolds digital literacy for children, and through appropriate regulation, our age verification trial, and our plans to introduce legislation to set a minimum age for social media and gaming platforms. Social media companies also have to own their responsibility for the safety of their young users, and we have a responsibility to make sure that they do it. Mr Speaker, I want to end by sharing the words of Lucia Frazetto, who wrote uh, an article in the Sydney Morning Herald about her own experiences with social media. And she says this, she says, social media's influence extends beyond the screen, subtly but significantly changing how we live and perceive ourselves. A ban wouldn't be about taking something away, but about giving the next generation a chance at a more authentic, balanced life. Before I call the member for Kennedy, I'll just do some acknowledgements. He will get the call. I'm pleased to inform that how, the House today that in the gallery are members of the Ballarat Future Shapers, a local leadership program hosted by the Minister for Infrastructure. 
and also members of the 2024 Fairly Leadership Program hosted by the member for Nichols and members of the National Chap Chaplaincy Association with Chairman Tams Tasman Cullingford in the gallery today. Welcome to you all. I give a call to the honourable member for Kennedy. Minister for Mines, is the bipartisan 2050 zero emissions target a lying hypocrisy or is Australia's coal industry to be abolished? 48,000 jobs and one twentieth of the economy to vanish. Since in India, solar and nuclear is as likely as the Bulamakanka Progress Association achieving a moon landing, doesn't 2050 condemn the 600 million people, half India, to continue to live without electricity? Surely heli power stations, ethanol Brazil model, and brilliant Minister Plibersek's kelp diesel algae ponds avoid the reality of Clausewitz's chilling aphorism Order. when goods don't cross borders then guns will. The, the member's time has well and truly expired. <laughs> Give a call to the Minister for Northern Australia and the Minister for Resources. Uh, thank you uh, very much Mr Speaker and I, I thank the member for Kennedy Order. for his question. Now I wouldn't want to limit of course the ambitions of the Bulamakanka Progress Association uh, but I do note uh, India's really important uh, commitment uh, to lowering emissions uh, and, and that is a country that of course holds the world's most populous is the world's most populous nation and they do have important ambitions I can assure uh, the member for Kennedy uh, that the coal industry will not be abolished it absolutely will not be as he says it supports 48,000 uh, jobs uh, in this country uh, and associated industries with it. But the question does go to the challenge of meeting uh, very important global net zero uh, targets, uh, given the global demand for reliable and affordable energy, which, as he says, uh, so many people around the world want. Uh, Australia's met coal exports were worth $61 billion uh, last year and thermal coal worth $37 billion. And that is royalties and taxation as well that goes, of course, into <coughs> uh, the uh, revenue of governments around the country, of coal mining states, uh, that then support infrastructure like hospitals uh, and roads. But what we do know is that demand for coal is changing uh, around the world as the global economy seeks to decarbonise and to reach net zero emissions. But as the International Energy Agency World Energy Outlook for 2023 has said, uh, it does confirm the role of Australian coal uh, in the global energy mix. Uh, I have been really fortunate uh, before I was Minister for Resources, but then since being Minister as well, to be able to visit uh, coal mines in New South Wales, I might add, not quite Queensland, uh, the, the Bloomfield Open Cut Mine in Maitland, uh, with the, my friend, the member for Patterson, the daughter of a coal miner. Uh, a family company that has an 80 plus year relationship with customers in Japan, and that will continue for some time to come. And also uh, experiencing the quite remarkable um, underground long wall mining uh, at the Ashton mine uh, with uh, my friend, the member for Hunter, who is an actual, actual coal miner, has been an actual coal miner, as opposed uh, to the cosplays uh, that we see in some other places. <laughs> uh, but, but, I, but I do so that is very hard work, uh, and uh, those people that work in those mines uh, deserve every cent they get for the hard work they do. Uh, that is why uh, this uh, government is really proud to have uh, same job, same pay, so that uh, those that work alongside one another with the same experience doing the same jobs do get treated equally for the hard work that they do, keeping our economy going uh, well into the future. Call to the member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister: How is the Albanese Labor government working to protect children from online harm? Call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Robertson for his question. And this is all about giving children a childhood and giving parents peace of mind and giving them support because uh, they know that they are concerned about uh, their young ones and the impact that social media is having on their lives, on their mental health, on their physical health, on their capacity to engage in real experiences with real people rather than uh, live their lives uh, virtually. Uh, I want young Australians to grow up playing outside with their friends on yeah, yeah. footy fields and netball courts, swimming pools, wherever they like. And today uh, we saw uh, 
again a celebration of great athletes when we welcomed home the Paralympians uh, that can inspire people to get out and really participate. Uh, too often, social media isn't social at all. The internet, of course, uh, connects us in ways that previous generations could never have imagined. But it has also created new harms, which we as a government must address, and governments around the world are trying to address. The solutions aren't simple. That's why uh, we need to have uh, trials and make sure that we get these things right. Uh, regulating technology is difficult. Uh, we're entering a new frontier, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Uh, we must. Uh, this is a complex problem. Uh, young people can find ways to get around rules uh, because the occasional young person might get access to alcohol doesn't mean we say we won't worry about uh, restricting alcohol to over 18s. We'll just let it all rip. We actually regulate and we organise as a society. We make decisions about protecting people. And that is what this is about. Uh, we have a comprehensive agenda for online safety that we've been implementing since the day we were elected, backing the eSafety Commissioner and quadrupling its funding, exploring a duty of care in the Online Safety Act review, tackling kids' access to pornography through new mandatory industry codes, passing legislation to ban the creation and distribution of deep fake pornography, establishing the Joint Select Committee on Social Media to hold platforms to account and funding the Age Assurance Trial in this year's budget in May. We're acting with purpose to get this right, getting on with the job of protecting Australian citizens. In particular, our focus here is protecting our youngest Australians during that period of life where their brain is developing, uh, where they're developing as human beings interacting with each other as well. It's a responsibility with, that we have, and it's one we are taking seriously. Give a call to the member for Hume. My question is to the Treasurer. Last week, the Treasurer accused the RBA of smashing the economy. Former RBA board member Graham Cray said, for the Treasurer to come out and say, well, this is the Reserve Bank's fault, I don't think a serious economist in the country would agree with that. With falling disposable income and sticky high inflation hurting households, why is this government fighting the Reserve Bank while Australian families are going backwards? To call to the Treasurer. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and to the Shadow Treasurer for a very similar question that I answered comprehensively a moment ago. <laughs> um, and I'll repeat it takes Order. usually it usually the takes the Shadow the Treasurer the a bit longer than the rest of us, so let me go through it once again. First of all, Mr Speaker, uh, any objective observer of the economy understands the combination of global economic uncertainty, persistent inflation and higher interest rates are slowing our economy, in our case quite considerably. And that's a point that I've been making since at least June uh, of this year. That's the first point. Uh, second point, when it comes to taking responsibility for our part in the fight against inflation, I do. I've said that not just earlier today, but I've said that uh, on a number of occasions, and I mean it. You know, I take responsibility for the fact that when we came to office and there were deficits as far as the eye can see and there was a trillion dollars in Liberal debt and not so enough to show for it, uh, that we took uh, important steps uh, to try and clean up the mess yeah, that we yeah. inherited. We turned those two big Liberal deficits into two Order big Labor surpluses. Connor. We found almost $80 billion in savings. We showed spending restraint because we knew that if we got the budget in better nick, we would help the Governor and the Reserve Bank in their fight against inflation, our fight against inflation. And Governor Bullock has acknowledged that our two surpluses are helping uh, in the fight against inflation. And so I make the same point again. Uh, I also repeat the point that I made earlier, Mr Speaker which is that the worst thing that any responsible decision maker in our economy should be contemplating right now is $315 billion in secret cuts. Uh, and the reason why they haven't come clean on that, Mr Speaker, is because it's a recipe for recession. Theirs is a recipe for recession, Mr Speaker. Order. The member for Morton is warned. Uh, member for Hume on a point of order. Relevance, Mr Speaker. The question did not mention alternative approaches, particularly alternative approaches that don't exist. 
Order. The, the shadow treasurer, the treasurer was not asked about alternative policies, alternative approaches. He has allowed some contrast for the remainder of the answer. I'm going to ask him to return. Order. I'm going to ask him to return to the question. Mr. Speaker, the point that I'm making uh, is that more than acknowledging uh, that people are doing it tough, we're doing something about it. And this side of the parliament is trying to help people doing it tough. Those side of the parliament would harm people with $315 billion in secret cuts to Medicare and pensions and payments, and that would be a recipe for recession. If they had their way, Australia would be in recession, wages would be lower, and there'd be no help with the cost of living. And we make no apology for taking a different approach, Mr. Speaker. And we are maintaining a primary Order. focus in the fight against inflation. It's one of the reasons why it's halved since the year that we were elected. Uh, it's why we've got the budget in better nick. It's why we're rolling out meaningful and substantial cost of living help in the most responsible way that we can. Uh, and the most irresponsible thing that we would be doing right now is pulling hundreds of billions of dollars out of the economy, as those opposite want to do. They should come clean on their cuts so that people know the choice. The Treasurer resume his seat. The member for McEwen. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. How is the Albanese Labor government helping Australians earn more and keep more of what they earn, and are there any threats to Australians earning more? I call to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and I, I thank the Honourable Member for the, for the question. And today's the day that the opposition finally gave up that, yes, they do want to cut people's pay. Today's the day that they finally decided to make the announcement. We'd, we'd gone for a decade where wages were being kept deliberately low. And then every time this government came forward with proposals that would get wages moving, we knew that they voted against them. But it wasn't until today, when we saw today's papers, that it was there crystal clear as to the fact that they intend to repeal the laws that have got wages moving. Now, up until now, we've referred to them about wanting people to work longer, and the Leader of the Opposition had committed before today that they were going to repeal the right to disconnect for every worker to be on call 24 7, whether they're paid to or not. But when they say that they'll repeal the laws, and they're clearly talking today about same job, same pay. You need to realise the sorts of amounts of money that they are taking in the next election that will be the cuts to household income. A whole lot of all of us, when we exercise our right to disconnect on Thursday afternoon, a whole lot of us will fly home. When people fly home, Order. when people fly home, are you going to tell? Are you lab. going to tell the Qantas flight attendants what you're intending to do to their pay? Because for a long time the labour hire loophole, and it was legal, was used by Qantas and, and other companies had used it as well, and the pay differences were not small. So you had an enterprise agreement that had been negotiated and then you could use a labour hire company in this occasion that was also run by Qantas and undercut the rates that were agreed to. Now for the flight attendants you might be seeing on Thursday afternoon, if they're employed directly, it's $68,500 a year that they're on. If they're Order. employed the through the labour hire company Ward. under labour hire loophole, it's not 68,000; it's 52,000 dollars. That's the award rate. Sixteen thousand dollar pay cut. It's good enough for them to help you onto the plane. It's good enough for them to serve you a drink while you're on the plane. It should be good enough to say they won't get a pay cut. And yet, when you commit to abolishing same job, same pay, you commit to cut people's pay. At the exact time that people are under pressure, exact Member time that Petrie. people are under pressure, the answer is not for people to be paid less. We knew that he believed in cuts. We knew that when he was Health Minister when he cut Medicare. We knew when they talked about their $315 billion of secret cuts that they had more cuts in store. But now, as of today, we know the cut to workers' pay is not simply Order. an instinct Minister's for them, it's a commitment. Concluded. Call to the Honourable Member for Hume. My question is to the Treasurer. Independent economist Chris Richardson says governments are throwing a lot of money at the symptoms of the cost of living crisis, but that worsens the cause of it. 
with falling disposable income and sticky high inflation hurting Australian households, why is this government fighting the Reserve Bank while Australian families are going backwards? Call to the Treasurer. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. In terms of people doing it tough, I think it speaks volumes that when the uh, Home Affairs Minister was talking about a $16,000 pay cut, those opposite were chuckling about it. They were opposite were chuckling about it. And doesn't that just go to the core of their approach and the difference between their approach and our approach, Order. Mr. The Speaker? Treasurer, return to the question. We do more than acknowledge, as he did in his question, that people are doing it tough. Uh, we are acting on it. We are helping with the cost of living. And we're getting wages moving again. And we're getting real wages Order. moving again as a consequence left. of our efforts, Mr. Speaker. Now, if uh, the commentary that the Shadow Treasurer read out is true now, imagine how much worse it would be if we were still running the huge deficits that we inherited from those opposite. They were running massive deficits when we came to office, and we turned two of those huge deficits into two substantial surpluses, Mr. Speaker. And the Reserve Bank Governor has Member made it really clear that those surpluses are helping in the fight against inflation. And when we came to office, the most recent budget from theirs opposite had zero savings in it. We found almost $80 billion in savings, Mr Speaker, and we put that in our three budgets. When those opposite were spending almost all of the upward revision to revenue from a stronger labour market and stronger commodity prices, we banked almost all of it. We did that deliberately. That has been an important part of our fiscal strategy, which has helped us clean up a lot of the mess that we inherited from those opposite. And because of our efforts, we're saving tens of billions of dollars in interest repayments, which is also helping the budget and making room for us to provide cost of living help and invest in housing and energy and skills and in a future made in Australia. And those are important objectives, Mr Speaker. Now, when I'm asked about government spending, uh, I think the time we're in the third year now of a three-year parliamentary term. It is long past time. If those opposite think there, are, there is $315 billion too much spending in the budget, then it's incumbent on them to come clean on their cuts and to tell us where those cuts will come from. And he asked me about government spending, Mr Order. Speaker. I'm allowed to talk about no, the, the implications— the, the, treas the, the Treasurer can, can pause because the member for Hume is entitled under the standing orders to raise a point of order. Well, relevance, Mr Speaker. The question did not ask about alternative approaches, particularly alternative approaches that exist in the Treasurer's imagination. The Treasurer was asked about government spending, so he's going to have to refrain from, if he wants to do a compare and contrast, he'll need to make it relevant to government spending. Yes, the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think the point I'm making is that those opposite wouldn't know the first thing about responsible economic management. And they said that they would deliver a surplus in their first year and every year after that, and they went none for nine. We've been here for two years and we've delivered two surpluses, Mr Speaker, two for two. None for nine, two for two, Mr Speaker. That's what I'm, that's what I'm attempting to educate the Shadow Treasurer and remind the Shadow Treasurer about, and as I said multiple times already. The Governor of the Reserve Bank has said that our surpluses are helping in the fight against inflation. Those surpluses wouldn't be possible without our responsible economic management and cleaning up the mess that those opposite left behind. Yeah. Call to the member for Higgins. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. How is the Albanese Labor government's responsible budget management right for the risks Australia faces and the pressures people are under? What approaches were rejected? The call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Speaker. I'm very grateful to the member for Higgins for the question, but also for the way that she engages in the big economic questions that we confront as a government. And as we know, the national accounts last week they showed that growth is slow and subdued in our economy, and a big part of that is consumption going backwards and especially discretionary spending falling. And this is another reminder of the pressures that people are under. Uh, but as a government, we have decided, you know, we have determined, we don't just acknowledge the pressures that people are under, we are actually doing something about it. And that's why we are rolling out our cost of living relief, a tax cut for every taxpayer, energy bill relief for every household, rent assistance, cheaper medicines, cheaper early childhood education and getting real wages moving again, Mr Speaker. Our primary focus is on the cost of living and rolling out our cost of living help. It's the major part of our efforts, but it's not the only part. We're doing this, as I said before, at the same time as we get the budget in much better nick than we inherited. 
Now we have, as I've said a couple of times, we inherited a couple of huge deficits. We turned them into substantial surpluses. And before the end of the month, Minister Gallagher and I will release the final budget outcome for the year that's just finished. And the surplus for the year just finished will be in the mid-teens in terms of billions of dollars, yeah, yeah. Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Now that means a $170 billion turnaround yeah, yeah. in the budget in two years, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. $170 billion turnaround from the mess that we inherited to the budget position that we've delivered in just two years in office, $170 billion. It wouldn't have happened without our responsible economic management. Member and as I've said a couple of times, the governor has made it clear that our surpluses are helping in the fight against inflation. Now, the key here is that we've maintained the right balance between a primary focus on inflation but also recognising the risks to jobs and growth in our economy. And because of the balance that we've struck, inflation has halved, we've avoided recession, there are a million new jobs, real wages are growing again, and every taxpayer is getting a tax cut, Mr Speaker. Now, there are no shortage of risks to the economy, and one of them sits over there, Mr Speaker, and that's because they want to slash $315 billion in spending without coming clean on where those cuts are coming from. Now, they need to come clean on their cuts. That $315 billion includes cost of living relief, pension indexation, Medicare and funding for warned. medicines and veterans, Mr Speaker. If they had their way, we'd be in recession right now. There'd be lower wages and less help for, being, for people doing it tough. They want to sacrifice Australians and their jobs and their economy to their divisive politics, and their approach is a recipe for recession. Our approach is all about managing the economy responsibly in a way that's right for the risks that we face and the pressures that people are under. Yeah. Before I call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, just reminding the Chamber, the member for Page, Barker, the Minister for Industry and the member for Morton are all on warnings. Consequences for actions will occur. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Treasurer. The ABC's Jacob Grieber has reported a senior Labor figure described RBA Governor Michelle Bullock as a nutter and the RBA in general as barbarians and weirdos. Has the Treasurer spoken to Wayne Swan or Paul Keating in relation to these matters? With falling disposable income and sticky high inflation hurting households, why is the Albanese Labor government fighting the Reserve Bank while Australian families go backwards? The first part of the question probably was more of an opinion, but the, the last part of the question was definitely in order. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm happy to answer all of it. Uh, first of all, I uh, haven't spoken to those uh, former Treasurers for more than a couple of weeks now, uh, and I know that those opposite are going around pretending and getting people to write uh, that somehow you know, there's been some element of coordination with the comments that uh, former Treasurers have made about these matters. I note that they're perfectly fine with former Treasurer Howard, former Treasurer Costello, former Treasurer Frydenberg out there in the public debate. But if you're a Labor, former Labor Treasurer, you've got no business being involved in it. I note Order. that. Member I haven't spoken Barker. to either of those two guys Member about O'Connor. their commentary or their views in at least uh, a couple of weeks, Mr Speaker. Now, as regards the other part of her question, uh, the question about the comments reported uh, by uh, Jacob Grieber, uh, who's up there in the gallery. Uh, I was asked this, I think, yesterday or the day before, and I said I completely disagree with those comments. I completely and utterly disagree with the comments that were made uh, to Jacob in this regard. I think I've already made that clear, and if I haven't, I make it clear right now. You know, I have a respectful working relationship with Governor Bullock and with her colleagues. As Governor Bullock has made Order. it clear on a number Deputy of occasions, of we work well together. We've got the same objective. We've got different responsibilities. And because of our combined efforts, we've seen inflation halve since the year we came to office. And that's important. That's the main game, Mr Speaker, the primary fight against inflation, at the same time as we roll out cost of living help and get the budget in better nick and invest in a future made in Australia and in housing and energy and skills, Mr Speaker. So I don't agree with those comments. I haven't discussed them with anyone, and I've answered this question before, and I'm happy to answer it again. Call to the honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Speaker.
My question is to the Minister for Education. What is the Albanese Labor government doing to boost wages of early childhood workers and keep prices down for families? And what has been the response? Call to the Minister for Education. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank my friend, the cracking member for Cunningham, for her question? Mr. Speaker, childcare workers, early educators are some of the most important workers in this country and some of the most underpaid. And they deserve a pay rise. And that's what this government is doing a 15 per cent pay rise. That means more than 100 bucks extra each week from this December and a pay rise of about 150 bucks extra from next December. All up, that's a pay rise of about $7,800 a year for more than 200,000 Australian workers. And tomorrow I'll introduce legislation to make that happen. And that's on top of the tax cuts that our early educators got a couple of months ago, a tax cut of more than $1,100. That's more money in the pockets of some of our lowest paid workers because of this Prime Minister and because of this government. Pay rises and tax cuts that wouldn't have happened if the Liberal Party had their way. We're not only delivering pay rises and tax cuts, we're also putting in place a cap on childcare fees at 4.4 per cent to keep prices down for parents. Now, under the Liberals, childcare fees went up by a whopping 49 per cent, double the OECD average. The changes that we put into place last year have already cut the cost of childcare for more than a million Australian families, and this is the next step. A pay rise for workers and a cap to keep prices down for more than a million Australian families. And here's just a sample of the reaction. Julie Price from the Community Childcare Association said this will be life-changing. Georgie Dent from the Parenthood said this is historic. Lisa Bonza, an early educator who has been working in early education for more than 20 years, said this is monumental. And the Liberal Party? Silence. <laughs> but they can't be silent forever. The last time we introduced legislation to increase the wages of early educators, they didn't just oppose it, they didn't just vote against it. They said in this place that they condemn it. Condemn it. And in the Senate, they described it as I tell them the truth. They described this as an absolute disgrace. Now we know, we know the Liberal Party was born in the 1940s. The problem is they're still there, and that their policies are still there. Every time we try to lift the wages or cut the taxes of people on low incomes, they stand against it. And it's time the Liberal Party made their way to the 21st century and support people who do some of the most important Order. work this in this country and back this bill completed. when I introduce the call to the Honourable Member for Warringah. Thank you. To the Prime Minister, in your previous answer, you talked of giving parents peace of mind and protecting children, yet you are being selective with which harm you address. Young Australians are being targeted and groomed to highly addictive, harmful gambling through constant advertising. Are you ignoring the vast majority of Australians' call to fully ban gambling advertising as soon as possible? Call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Warringah for her question. And uh, the answer is no, we are not. My government has done more to act against uh, harmful gambling than any government in Australian history, more in just two years by undertaking action. We know when we look at uh, where the uh, harmful gambling comes from, almost 70 per cent of that harmful gambling is actually poker machines. Uh, more than around about 15 per cent off the top of my head, it's about that figure, uh, comes from lotteries and lotto and those tickets as well. I'm yet to see uh, anyone stand up in this place and advocate banning completely all advertising of lottery and lotto tickets. We know that gambling advertising, when it comes uh, to sport, uh, is uh, too prevalent. Uh, we know that it can be really annoying, apart from anything else, when you're watching uh, sport. 
and we know that we want to take an approach which is responsible but makes a difference as well. That is why we have undertaken uh, serious consultation uh, with everyone from Tim Costello, uh, the anti-gambling lobby, who don't want advertising stopped, many of them, they want gambling stopped, full stop. And that is the truth of their position. And that's a legitimate position for them to take, but it's not one that I have in terms of stopping all racing, for example, stopping all gambling uh, right across the board, because I think that uh, that would uh, have an impact and an intrusion into people's uh, personal liberties, uh, which is not appropriate in my view. I respect that some people have a different view. I do not. I do not believe that the state has an absolute right to determine the behaviour of individuals across the board. What I do do, though, is believe that we have a responsibility to restrict the damage that uh, harmful advertising can have. I think that we need to act, and part of what we're looking at, you go to age, is the impact of when ads are available is a major factor here. I don't think there should be any advertising aimed at children. I don't think there should be any advertising during G-rated uh, programs and during children's programs. I think that we need to make sure that adults can be adults, but children can be children. <laughs> and the connection as well between sport and gambling needs to be broken because sport should be enjoyed for what it is, sport. And that is an important focus of why we are undertaking these reforms. I give the call to the honourable member for Tangney. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. How is the Al Albanese Labor government providing equity for women in their retirement through paying superannuation on paid parental leave? And what threats are there to this support for parents? Call to the Minister for Social Services. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Tangney for his question. Of course, over the last two years, the Albanese Labor government has boosted and modernised our paid parental leave after a decade of neglect and attacks from those opposite. We've made our paid parental leave more flexible to meet the needs of modern families, improved means testing and, of course, extended it to 26 weeks. Additional weeks have already been rolling out, supporting families right now. Now, our government's next step is to legislate paying superannuation on paid parental leave yeah. to ensure that those taking paid parental leave get the support they need at the time of birth of a baby, but also don't lose out in retirement. Now, we know that women on average retire with 25 per cent less superannuation than men of the same age. And that's why, of course, we've introduced legislation to pay superannuation on paid parental leave to help close that gap. Now, Speaker, I was asked what could threaten the support for women in retirement. Now, I thought when we announced our plan for superannuation on paid parental leave, that was a key recommendation from the Women's Economic Equality Task Force that we would receive bipartisan support. <laughs> Indeed, I was very heartened when the member for Farrah in March, in response to our proposal, said she believed in closing the superannuation gap. And I, of course, then was, thought there would be bipartisan support. However, we have now seen, just as the Leader of the Opposition has opposed every single cost of living measure that we have, they have now decided to oppose our plan to pay superannuation on paid parental leave. Now, of course, this latest thought bubble from the member for right. Deakin to encourage parents to cash out that member payment and not put it towards their retirement savings is just another idea straight from the IPA. 
Of course, this is the opposition's latest the attack the on superannuation, a system that ensures that we, people the can retire the in dignity. It's also, of course, those opposites' latest attack on paid parental leave. I don't need to remind the House that those opposite, when they're in government, called women that took paid parental leave from both the government and their employer double dippers. They demonise them on Mother's Day. What an insult to Australian women. It is only Labor that can be trusted with our superannuation Order. system, and it is only Labor that can be trusted with paid parental leave. Yeah. Give a call to the honourable member for Nichols. My question is to the Treasurer. Over the last two years, Australian households have experienced the largest fall in disposable incomes in the OECD. That's more than the UK, the US, Germany, France, Italy and Canada. With falling disposable income and sticky high inflation hurting households, why is the Albanese Labor government fighting the Reserve Bank while Australian families are going backwards? Give the call to the Treasurer. Well, thanks, uh, Mr Speaker. I, I say respectfully to the honourable member. Uh, if we agree that Australians are doing it tough, and I think that we do, uh, it's a bit bizarre that those opposite want people to earn less and they want to get less help with the cost of living. Yeah. And they didn't want everyone to get a tax cut. And they didn't want every household to get energy bill relief. Order, the and they presided over a decade business. of deliberate wage stagnation and wage suppression. And so, Mr Speaker, those opposite have got to make up their mind. They've got to decide uh, whether they agree that people are doing it tough. We understand that people are doing it especially tough. And they've got to decide whether they want to be part of the problem or part of the solution. That's right. And part of the problem would be if they uh, swung the axe at Medicare and pensions and all of the things that they're contemplating and their $315 billion in cuts, that would make things worse rather than better. And the leader of the opposition has jumped. Oh, the member for Spence is warned. Any member can take a point of order. And the, the member for Hume is doing so. He has the call. Relevance, Mr Speaker. Uh, there was no mention of alternative policies in the question, and the Treasurer's imagination is running wild, Resume as always. Seat. The member for Hume was given the courtesy for a point of order. He does not need to add extra commentary to every point of order. The Treasurer is entitled to some compare and contrast, but I'll just draw him back to the question to make sure he is being relevant. Okay, speaker. Uh, the point that I'm making is I, I believe that everyone uh, in this parliament understands, as indeed I believe every Australian understands, uh, that people are doing it tough right now. And the choice that we have as the people's representatives here in the House is whether we want to work hard to uh, try and help people who are doing it tough or whether we want to further harm people doing it tough. And if you attacked right. Medicare, as they did last time they were in office, if they cut wages Order. like the Leader of the Opposition the is proposing no, today— No, the treasurer, treasurer just needs to make sure his answer. Yeah. He wasn't asked about the Opposition. He wasn't asked about alternative policies. He wasn't asked to give a, an opinion. Order. The member for Barker. So, as much as the Treasurer is— giving his answer about the opposition. He won't be able to do that for the remainder of his answer. He's done a compare and contrast. He just needs to return to the question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, we acknowledge, uh, as the questioner did, uh, that people are under pressure. Uh, we're doing something about it. Uh, we're providing a tax cut for every taxpayer here, to help here, people. Here, here. We're providing energy bill relief for every household to help here, here. people. We're getting wages moving again to help people. Uh, we're making medicines cheaper to help people. We're making early childhood education cheaper to help people. We've boosted rent assistance twice in a row because we want to help people, especially in that instance, people doing it tough in the rental market. And so the acknowledgement that people are doing it tough is important, and I think there's a consensus on that. The difference is the choice that we have to make here is helping people or harming people, and we're helping people. And we're doing that. We're doing that in the face of uh, deeply irresponsible and deeply divisive opposition from the Liberal and National parties. Uh, and Order, the member for Casey. 
and we will continue to help people where we responsibly can, rather than acknowledge but then ignore the pressures that people are under. Yeah. Call to the member for Gilmore. My question is to the Minister for Skills and Training. How is the Albanese Labor government supporting Australians to gain the skills that are in demand while easing cost of living pressures? What approach to skills has the government rejected? Call to the Minister for Skills and Training. Thanks, Speaker. And I thank the member for Gilmore for her Order. question. I acknowledge her long career working in education, skills and training on the South Coast, including as a TAFE teacher. I also anticipate a very no, long career minister, for her in this pause. place. The minister, the minister will pause. The minister will pause. I can't hear what is being said. So now a general warning is issued, which means if people interject, they'll suffer the consequences. Because I can't hear the answer. The question was given the respect of being heard in silence. We're in. Ten seconds in, and this is a wall of noise. It's not on. It's not happening. The Minister for Skills and Training has the call. Thanks, Speaker. The member for Gilmore knows that a strong vet sector is critical to Australians getting secure and well-paid work, and for businesses in her area and all of our areas getting the skills they need. Speaker, yesterday was National TAFE Day, and together with educators from right around the country on this side of the House, we celebrated the group of people who make so much possible for so many, Australia's TAFE teachers. Our teachers, in a real sense, are our TAFEs. Their passion, their leadership and their hard work is helping Australians get high-quality skills for today's workforce and for tomorrow too. TAFE changes lives and plays a vital role in giving people skills they need for secure and well-paid jobs. It's where so many of our nurses, early childhood educators and tradies begin their careers. And after years of being systematically run down by those opposite, the Albanese government is committed to realising the potential of TAFE for the benefit of every Australian. With fee-free TAFE, we've now helped more than 500,000 Australians secure their place. That's half a million people learning in-demand skills to work in construction, housing, aged care, cyber security, easing cost of living pressures, Speaker, while helping businesses get the skilled workers they need. And last week, the National Centre for Vocational Education and Research released its latest report, and that revealed a substantial increase in the number of students undertaking VET last year, more than five million students taking part in some form of nationally recognised training, up by more than 10 per cent. The data also shows that more students are studying VET qualifications, numbers increasing by 6.7 per cent to 2.1 million from last year from the year before that. And this is growth principally driven by domestic government funded students, including fee free TAFE. The most popular qualifications, Speaker, included early childhood education and care. And that's not surprising because, together with fee free TAFE, there has never been a better time to be an early childhood educator. We're making studying more affordable for future educators, and by backing a 15 per cent pay rise, we are making sure when they graduate they'll be paired paid fa fairly for this important work. But while we are investing in Australians and helping students with the cost of living, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition describes fee-free TAFE as wasteful. She is wrong, because there is nothing wasteful about training our future care workers and tradies. The, the Minister will pause the Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker, I appreciate that this Minister has not been on his feet for quite some time, but the question to him from his own side did not invite a compare and contrast, no. nor did it invite him yeah, to consider just... the policies of the Opposition. Yeah, I want to hear from the Leader of the House. I'll just raise two things. One, that was a deliberate abuse of a point of order, and two, it was done after he would given a general warning. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition didn't hear the question, because in the question it said what approaches were rejected. Order. I don't need sound effects on my right either. So I'm willing to give everyone a fair go when it comes to points of order, if anyone jumps up, but not to be taken advantage of. It's not appropriate. It's not how this parliament is going to work, and it's not how this parliament has worked. So there's consequences for actions. The deputy leader will leave the chamber under 94A. The minister, 
for home affairs, uh, for <laughs> housing and homelessness. Order. The Minister in continuation. Speaker, as Minister, I've been meeting students right around Australia who, fee free TAFE, have given the opportunity to become nurses, early educators, bricklayers, locksmiths, fitters, and turners. They've had the opportunity, thanks to fee free TAFE, to learn the skills they need. And when they begin their careers, they will be earning more and keeping more of what they earn, thanks to the Albanese Labor government. Yeah. Call to the honourable member for Indi. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Early Childhood Education. Out of school hours care services at small rural schools across my electorate face imminent closure after sustainability funding was cut. If these services close, parents won't be able to work in a cost of living crisis. It is clear there is not enough money in the Community Child Care Fund. Will the Minister stand by while vital child care services close due to a lack of government funding? Call to the Minister for Early Childhood Education, the Minister for Youth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Indi for her question and in the constructive way in which she has engaged uh, in relation to early childhood education in her electorate and indeed um, on issues on early childhood education right across Australia. Um, now the Community Child Care Fund that the member alluded to supports early childhood education and care services to open and to stay open. And just by way of background, it's a more than $600 million program, currently supporting around 700 services across Australia, and 85 per cent of those services are in regional and remote areas. Uh, the recently announced Triple CF or Community Child Care Fund Round 4. More than 380 services received uh, Office of Office of Sustainability support to help them remain open, and 90 services received office, offers of capital support. Uh, that's to help them undertake important modification or expansion of their work. And that includes five services in the members' electorate that received sustainability funding and two services that received capital funding. The CCCF Round 4 grant opportunity was a competitive grant. It's a competitive grant process run by the department and decisions are made at arm's length from the minister. I make no apologies for that in the interests of transpar transparency, in the interests of accountability and in the interests of integrity. It is important that these competitive grants are run in a way in which selection is based on merit. The guidelines for the grant opportunity were published on Grant Connect. The assessment criteria remained broadly similar across all CCCF uh, rounds, Triple CF rounds uh, for sustainability funding, but there were some, some changes in the, in the grant guidelines reflecting lessons learned on reviews of previous grant, grant rounds. And uh, those lessons and the feedback that we got on those was that the, uh, the, the round should be open to applications from priority areas as well as services that had been successful in previous rounds as well as vulnerable and disadvantaged cohorts. Now, I appreciate that it can be disappointing for services when they don't get, uh, when they're not successful in competitive grants. Uh, I can really appreciate that, and I can appreciate the difficulty for families and communities, and I can uh, appreciate the way in which we can continue to discuss this, uh, for, particularly for your electorate as well, for the member for Indi. I'd encourage uh, the member to relay to those services that there is a Triple CF special circumstances round that they may be eligible to apply for and encourage them to see whether or not that is a viable option. Before I call the member for Bendigo, I'd like to acknowledge in the gallery my guest, the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Mr David Sheridan of Travancore. And I'd like to give the call to the member for Bendigo. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia. How is the Albanese Labor government supporting Australian resource sector and delivering a future made in Australia? What approaches to, re to the resources sector have been ruled out? The call to the Minister for Resources and the Minister for Northern Australia. 
very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the member for Bendigo for her question. Last night I was delighted to attend the Women in Resources National Awards alongside the member for Bendigo uh, and other parliamentary colleagues. And, uh, the member for Bendigo, in fact, is from a, a very proud mining region, and she had two uh, finalists in these awards, which was a fantastic night celebrating exceptional women in mining, an industry that traditionally does have a low participation rate. But these awards went to women uh, in mining trades, uh, as well as Order, technology and the science behind the a really very successful resources sector. Mr Speaker, the Albanese Labor government's last budget featured the most significant investment in, resource, in the resources sector for a generation. The centrepiece of this government delivering a future made in Australia is the $17 billion production tax incentive for critical minerals and rare earth elements, which will drive processing onshore and create secure jobs right around this country. Also delivering a future made in Australia is a $3.4 billion resourcing Australia's prosperity program, which will allow Geoscience Australia to help find those resources and the likely locations of critical mineral deposits for many years to come. We've committed millions of dollars to supporting common user processing facilities and boosting our trade partnerships for critical minerals. All of these budget measures combined with our international partnerships demonstrate just how this government will support the Australian resources sector because we understand that the resources sector is the engine room of our economy. We have invested over $400 million to speed up environmental approvals and our reforms will reduce red tape. We have doubled the number, through Minister Plibersek, the number of on-time approvals since the last government. We are doing much better than the former government in respect of approvals and, in fact, we have approved Order. 14 mining-related projects uh, under the EPBC Act alone. In addition, with supporting the resources sector, we've boosted the critical minerals facility to $4 billion and the Northern Australia infrastructure facility to $7 billion. The NAIF has supported, in the past two years since I've been minister, seven resources projects to the tune of $1.4 billion, leveraging $13 billion in private capital in concert with <laughs> export-import banks from around the world. This is 7,000 jobs across Northern Australia. That's 7,000 jobs that backs the resources sector. And what have those opposite done? Well, of course, all they've always done is said no. They've taken the resources sector for granted for eternity and they will continue to do so, while this government will make sure those 7,000 jobs happen in the resources sector right across the north, and that's because we will deliver a Order. future made Minister's in Australia. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Call to the honourable member for Dawson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. President of Queensland Association of State Schools Principals, Patrick Murphy, has told the Senate's cost of living inquiry that parents are increasingly having to withdraw their kids from school opportunities because they are struggling to make ends meet. Mr Murphy said, quote, we are seeing 60 per cent of kids not going on camps and excursions. With falling disposable income and sticky high inflation hurting households, why is the Albanese Labor government fighting the Reserve Bank while Australians' families are going backwards? Give the call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. We're fighting for Australians doing it tough. That's right. Uh, and we're fighting for people who deserve a tax cut. We're fighting for people who deserve a bit of help with their electricity bills. We're fighting for better wages and getting real wages growing again. We're fighting for cheaper medicines. We're fighting for cheaper early childhood education. We're fighting for more rent assistance. We're fighting to ensure uh, that the people who need and deserve this parliament's help are getting it. Because the issues that Patrick has raised, and I take them seriously, I take him seriously. And any decent local member worth their salt understands that people are under pressure right now, and that's why we're doing what we can to help people. And that's why it beggars belief that those opposite oppose our cost of living measures. They called for an election over a tax cut for every taxpayer. They don't support cheaper energy, they don't support cheaper early childhood education, they don't support rent assistance, they don't support cheaper medicines, and they don't support getting wages moving again. Well, we do, because more than acknowledge the pressures that people are under, we're doing something about it. Yeah. Call to the honourable member for 
Hunter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Sport. What impact have Australians, Australia's brilliant Paralympians had on our country and what help is the government providing athletes for the Games in Los Angeles 2028 and Brisbane in 2032? Give the call to the Minister for Aged Care and the Minister for Sport. I thank the member for Hunter for his question. He is a proud five-time Olympian, a very talented sports person and dead set legend, if I may express a personal opinion. <laughs> Um, this morning we welcomed our brilliant Paralympians home following two weeks of transformative performances. All 160 athletes in Paris excelled, from the youngest 15-year-old Holly Warne to the eldest 69-year-old table tennis whiz Jimmy Huo. The highlights were spellbinding. Alexa Leary dancing her way to two golds in the pool, Lauren Parker becoming the first Australian to win golds in multiple sports in 48 years. Our Paralympians won 18 gold and 63 medals total. The Paris Games may have deprived us of our sleep but has provided us with record-breaking moments of triumph over adversity cementing sport as Australia's connective tissue. Paris 2024 was the spiritual arm squeeze between millions of people across thousands of kilometres, even at 4am. And every coffee was worth it, because as a society we are increasingly isolated, we are increasingly siloed, we are increasingly lonely. But sport Sport makes us hug strangers, and that's what it did, especially the Paralympics, which provides that rare combination of preventative, mental and physical health benefits, and the chance to both cheer and cry at the same time. But the Albanese government is doing more than cheering. We are committing. What people deserve from inclusion and equity is substance and structural change. To know barriers won't just be reported, but they will be acted upon. And our government has acted and made record-breaking investment into our Paralympians, doubling the funding over the next two years to almost $55 million. Yeah. The Albanese government's commitment will shift the balance of sport funding in this country from 85 per cent able-bodied and 50 per cent people with disability to 75 and 25 per cent. This is part of a record government spend in sport overall of almost $500 million over the next two years. We also invested an additional $20 million to help our Olympic and Paralympic athletes qualify for Paris. And we provided Australia's para-athletes with the same financial incentives for winning medals at the Paris Games as our Olympians. Our Paralympian gold medalists received $20,000, our silver medalists received $15,000 and our bronze medalists received $10,000 because we recognise high-performance sport is exactly that, no matter which body you are performing high-performance sport in. From playground to podium, from junior pathways to Paris, from backyards to Brisbane 2032, the Albanese government is backing our Australian athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Call to the member for Bowman. My question is to the Treasurer. Jess and Russell from Alex Hills have told me our interest rates skyrocketed. We now have to find an additional $500 every week. The government seems indifferent to whether we can put food on our table. With falling disposable income and sticky high inflation hurting households, why is the Albanese Labor government fighting the Reserve Bank while Australian families are going backwards? Yeah. Call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I hope the honourable member told Jess and Russell that he didn't want them to get any help with their electricity bills. And I hope he told Jess and Russell that he thought that they Order. should get a smaller tax member cut. Bowman. And I hope he told Jess and Russell that he thought that medicines should be more expensive, early childhood should be more expensive, there should be less help with rent, and that they should be paid less. They should work longer for less, Mr. Speaker. Order. I member hope he Banks. explained all of that to his constituents. And if he didn't, he's not being especially honest, Mr. Speaker, because you don't get to wander around your electorate in that beautiful part of South East Queensland and pretend that he cares about the cost of living and then come here and not support cost of living help. You don't get to wander around the Redlands, that stunning part of South East Queensland, and nod your head when people tell you they're doing it tough and then come here and vote against helping them. The member for Bowman on a point of order. 
Just on relevance, Speaker, I agree the Redlands is a wonderful part of South East Queensland, but I wonder if the Treasurer might be interested in actually answering my question. Well, the, the, tre order, the, the Treasurer was mentioning the people's names in the answer. I just got to make sure that it, it is directly relevant to what the, he was asked about, the constituents. And if, so far, the Treasurer is being directly relevant. If he was talking about other people, may not be so lucky, but he has the call. Thank you, Speaker. He asked me about his constituents, and I'm talking about his constituents. Indeed, constituents right around Australia are under uh, substantial financial pressure, and that's why we're helping them. That's why we're helping them with a tax cut for every taxpayer, energy bill relief, cheap early child education, rent assistance, getting wages moving again, in all of the ways that we are helping people with the cost of living pressures that they're under right now. Um, we're fighting inflation, and inflation has halved since the year that we were elected, as the Prime Minister said uh, earlier on in question time. If those opposite, and especially the honourable member, really cared about the cost of living pressures that our constituents are under, they would support our efforts to help with the cost of living. Instead, they oppose them. Order. Call to the honourable member for McNamara. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and Water. How many renewables projects has the Albanese Labor government ticked off? How will these project make projects make energy cleaner and cheaper for all Australians? And how is the government's approach different to other proposals? Call to the Minister for the Environment, the Minister for Water. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks so much to the member for McNamara for his question. I know that he is a huge supporter of renewable energy, and I'm delighted to inform the House that I've now ticked off the 60th renewable energy project backed by this government. These 60 projects mean that we have now, on this side, ticked off enough renewable energy to power 7 million Australian homes. That is the equivalent of powering every home in New South Wales, in Victoria and South Australia. And it means that we're ticking off renewable energy projects at the rate of about one every two weeks. On Friday, I ticked off the Order. huge 600-megawatt uh, Birrawa solar farm in New South Wales, which will see the construction of around a million solar panels as well as 600 megawatts of battery storage. That's enough for 229,000 New South Wales homes. It's also part of the Central West Arana Renewable Order. Energy Zone, which the recently of the opposition will received cease approval for a transmission line. Uh, also recently, the Sun Cable project, uh, six gigawatts of renewable energy, including four gigawatts to be used in Darwin, that's the equivalent of powering three million homes. That's 6,000. Uh, the the Leader of the Opposition hasn't heard of batteries. It's so sad. And wind power hasn't heard that the wind blows at night. <laughs> hasn't worked out that hydroelectricity works at night. The energy transition is real. It's happening. We're also providing $300 Order, worth of, of energy bill relief. We're putting cheaper power into the grid right now for households, right now for businesses. The alternative from those opposites is the most expensive form of energy, maybe in 20 years' time, with no details about costs. What we had from those opposite was Order. nine years of delay and denial. We had 22 separate energy policies. They didn't land a single one of them. They were told when they were in government that 24 coal-fired power stations were closing. They had no plan to replace that generation capacity. No plan for energy, no plan for workers, no plan to bring power prices down now. They're talking the the about Nationals something that might happen in 20 years' time. They have no plan to help Australian households now. Just ask them. Yeah. Call the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Um, I ask further questions be placed on the notice.